As this public health crisis has pushed artists, nonprofits, and literally everyone else deeper into the digital space, we've been getting a lot of questions from the field about general best practices when it comes to social media platforms. And to be honest, even if this isn't your first rodeo, the saturation of content online is like nothing we've ever seen before. So that being said, I'm glad to welcome our peer experts that are helping us tackle this topic today. Coming in from Evansville, we have Zach Evans, who is the Commun Communications and Community Project Manager for the Arts Council of Southwestern Indiana. In Indianapolis, Claire Mushbaugh is joining us from Indiana Humanities, where she serves as the Events and Communications Associate. From Fort Wayne, Alicia Pyle, a very talented musician, is joining us. And from Lafayette, Caitlin Thomas, who is the office manager of the Art Museum of Greater Lafayette. But to get us all started, I'd like to introduce um, some very special guests from Kix Digital Marketing. Brooke Heffernan, the Partnership Director, and Josh Donaldson, Marketing Director, will be getting us started today. Go ahead and take it over, Brooke. Perfect. Um, thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Brooke Heffernan, as she mentioned. I'm the Partnership Director. Josh Donaldson, our Director of Marketing, joins me as well, and you'll be hearing from him a bit later. Um, Kix Digital Marketing is a firm located in Fountain Square in Indy. Um, we have mostly small to mid-sized clients that we work with, with the exception of a couple of juggernaut B2B clients here and there. Um, but essentially, what we do extends from brand development work, web development work, all the way to the tactical marketing execution side, anything from social media, email marketing, and digital ad spend strategy and ongoing content. So we're kind of running the gamut here. Um, it all brings us here, COVID kind of all brings us here today digitally, and thankfully we're able to leverage technology that's been at our disposal, and we maybe have taken it a little bit for granted, but are certainly leaning into it now more than, more than ever. Um, the world has basically been turned on its head and we're all defining new normals day by day. Um, the good news is, is that for a lot of marketing, we have a lot of constants and in fact, a lot of opportunities. And we're gonna talk through some of those today. Um, there's a lot that's not changed. And while these times are certainly unprecedented in terms of the economy, there have been downturns and collapses before. Um, and thankfully, we have some historical data to look back in and help us guide ourselves into the future. Obviously, rules change um, over the course of history as consumer behavior and our access to technology changes as well. Um, but if we look back even well into the recessions of the 70s and onwards, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that companies who are continuously leaning into marketing methodologies not only sustain throughout downturns, but are quick, more quickly able to rebound when things are on the up and up. Um, so as consumers' needs are evolving now more than ever, um, we have to pay attention to what some long-term um, implications can be. Josh is gonna talk through some uh, examples that we have just re in recent history with ad spend. Yeah, pretty, pretty briefly, um, what I try to do, especially heading into a situation like this that's, you know, in most of our lifetimes, like unprecedented, right? So um, to experience this firsthand, it, it is interesting to put uh, some type of collective data together and what the impact is on marketing as a whole. What we looked like, uh, at first was our clients spending money on paid advertising and what the implications were after they decreased or cut their complete spend budget. And when we looked specifically at platforms like pay-per-click advertising, every client that decreased their budget or cut it completely has completely lost market share. Whereas our clientele who has kept the status quo and after the first two weeks of data that we've collected and then our analytics reporting on the successes, we've actually seen more growth for those companies and those organizations that we manage. So based on, I'm gonna use the home service specific area, uh, just as a quick example. For most of those clients that we've managed that kept the status quo or increased their budgets, we found a 20 to 25% increase in activity, be it conversions or just general clicks and impressions, right? But in the two weeks following the stay at home order, we ended up seeing an additional five to 7% increase in those client successes with conversions, uh, click-through rates, and also ultimately 
we found that as the competition had lessened because people have cut their budgets and have fallen off the map essentially, we saw cost per acquisition actually decrease by about 15%. So kind of referencing a, a document that Brooke mentioned earlier, uh, following the initial uh, downturn in 2007, in the following year, the first quarter of 2008, we saw a similar trend where people who had maintained their ad spend in digital marketing actually saw exponential growth in their returns as well through the first quarter of 2018 when they turned their advertising more towards the digital spectrum. That's more likely due to the implication that it is easily targeted and highly measurable. Yeah, so when we're talking about uh, marketing segmentation and, and ad spend specifically, um, the things that we're going to be noticing that are, are going to change, um, segmentation is going to become a little bit less about these kind of superficial demographic makeups or segmentations. Um, and what I'm talking about is like if you're a painter that works largely on the northwest side of Indianapolis and likes to work within these um, counties or zip codes or this socioeconomic level, male, female, uh, things of, of this nature are going to become a little less relevant. Um, what's becoming more relevant are more psychological factors, um, people's relationships with the economy and, and their belief in recovery and their own financial well-being and where um, goods and services sort of fall into those lanes. So kind of breaking things up, we'll look at four major demographics right now. So First of all, we have people who are slamming on, on the brakes with all spend, right? Only the essential things are getting covered. Um, they're near to a total spending freeze. These people are scared. They're highly affected. Um, then you have people who are pained, um, but patient. They're feeling a little bit of that pinch. There's a lot of uncertainty. Certainly their essentials are covered, but some of those treats or more um, the, that extemporaneous expendable uh, spend isn't happening as, as regularly. Um, you've got folks who are comfortably well off, uh, maybe those who are financially prepared before all of this happened. These people tend to be a younger demographic too, where they're going to be able to weather the storm and have a lot of maybe working years ahead of them um, and feel very confident in financial recovery. They're going to be moderating more of those luxurious expenses. Um, so if you think about maybe remodeling a home, maybe the driveway doesn't get repaved this year. Maybe that's something we put off or plan for for the future instead of something you might have been doing this summer. Um, and then you have this kind of anomaly, this unicorn of, of folks, we'll call them uh, live for the day, um, where savings be damned, it doesn't really matter. They're very brand loyal. We'll call them the honey badgers of the economy. These folks are living for the, for the day. Um, but what you're going to find in this time is that, you know, how consumers track, um, we're going to need to track and how they're reassessing and reprioritizing, uh, reallocating their funds. Um, people are going to switch brands uh, during this time, things that they were once very loyal to. Uh, before coming into this, the narrative was very strong in terms of shop local, buy local, a lot of grassroots momentum happening, support small business. And there's a lot of that still going on. And we're going to talk through some examples of great transitions um, throughout this. But one of the things I want us to consider when we're, we're discussing this today is, you know, let's be thinking of how we can meet people where they are. Um, and right now people are at home. And what do they want to have accomplished? What do they want from you? Um, I, I kind of think of what I want right now. Um, I want ease and familiarity and comfort and to feel some semblance of control and participation and that I'm doing uh, things to make an impact and feel connected and doing everything that I can to make that better. So we're going to talk through some platforms and some ways in which we can help people get what they need during this time. Um, we thought it might be helpful to share with you. Um, we recognize that not every Every industry uh, or organization operates in the same way, but we thought it might be helpful to share with you some of the ways in which um, we're leveraging platforms to make things easier for us operationally internally, um, as well as our external client communication as well. So Josh is going to talk you through some of those platforms. Yeah, the, I think the one of the kind of interesting things is for especially us um, as a company is that we're not uh, new to the digital 
world of uh, working remotely. We did this for nearly a year, uh, two, two or so years ago. So we kind of had a, um, a leg up on what works and what doesn't work. And we transitioned from so many different uh, communications channels, collaboration tools, different ways that we could interact with each other and then simultaneously interact with our clientele to make it the most effective possible for both. And for internal team collaboration, obviously, you know, I see some of the comments in the chat right now about organizations that are trying to find a way to move programs online using video or a mix of Facebook and video. And, and it can be tough if you don't set up the right uh, steps, right? You got to lay the foundation. So if you're working with a team and we're all segmented out into our own homes now and we have to find a way to collaborate together, it's finding the right communications tools. And the most powerful one that we all probably know of is Slack. I mean, it is so powerful. It helps us get the fastest answers possible. It allows us to collaborate with our teams. But what comes out of that is a lot of conversation and the execution is just as important. So one thing we always try to recommend to a client or organization that we work with or kind of help audit is a project management tool. And we, we believe that Rike is probably one of the most powerful, robust tools that we've used. Um, one thing we like to do is, especially now that we're all separated into different, different areas, we are no longer within earshot and we can throw a question over to somebody to not bog your team down and ask them what they're doing and when using a tool like Rike will kind of help you see what their workflow is like. If they are inundated, can you step in and help them? Are they having troubles? It allows you to, to really hyper-focus the conversation about one deliverable at a time versus throwing it into the general communications channel like a Slack. Um, personally, we, we use a dashboard we call God View because it's all seeing and all knowing. And at any time we can see what all of our clients are being served when and where our team is at and who's working on what at what time. It's pretty amazing. And another thing that comes out of it though, is if you're an organization that fields a lot of communication or feedback from your, uh, your audience, right? Uh, form submissions can be pretty muddy if you get too many at the same time. Now you're fielding a ton of emails. You might lose track because this one came in and you get to it first and but the first one that came in gets overlooked. Utilizing these tools like Rike, you can create zaps from Zapier that allow you to feed all of your support requests, requests into one spot and you can tackle them on a chronological order versus taking them as they come through your inbox or even on the phone. And another thing that we always like to look at is what type of CRM can you use? And I don't wanna sound like, like doom and gloom completely, because we don't know what the next week will lead to. We don't know uh, where our individual futures lie uh, with our careers, right? So one of the things that's really important is to set your team up for success on the off chance that something happens where you need somebody else to take over in your position or for you, if you are, you know, uh, plagued by COVID yourself, right? So a tool like HubSpot or something that can track your email communications is going to help you 100% track the, the level of communication that each person has individually through your organization. Where did, say for instance, Zach leave off on his communication with a client or somebody that he's working with, whereas Brooke could pick up on the conversation without having to double back and kind of do that little uh, humil hum humility of asking, well, where did you leave off with so-and-so, right? It just sets you up for looking as professional as possible. Those tools are great for the internal collaboration, but what's equally as important is your collaboration with any clientele or any users that you are publicly facing, right? So that communication, while still applicable and you can invite your audience into those channels, and give them specific shared permissions, it's nice to keep them separated. And what we have found is that a lot of our communication over the last, I don't know, bro, probably two or three years had transitioned really far away from communication over the phone. So, I mean, we all remember the times where you would smile and dial, pick up the phone and have, you know, valuable conversations with the advent of digital worlds. We now are locked into sometimes email communication. People are too busy to have a phone call. Right now, we find it's no time like the present to pick up the phone, have a conversation. People are at home, they're secluded, they want the interaction. 
And you're actually uncovering a lot more in those conversations. They've become highly valuable. So that is probably one of the most basic things that we could say. However, we're using one of the most powerful tools possible right now, which is Zoom. It, it gets so much done faster, more efficiently. People can see expressions. We know that sometimes the context of what you say is not read unless you see the look on your face. So when somebody says K period, like our ever loving CEO, you don't know if it's sarcastic or he's just agreeing with you. So tools like Zoom, GoToMeeting, Google Hangouts, those are beautiful tools to use. But when it comes to the arts and design and collaboration, those are the ones that I find myself when managing client projects to be the stickiest. To get real great feedback without being able to sit in front of somebody and really pull in what they're thinking, maybe sketch something out on the whiteboard, pull apart a design through, um, you know, just sitting down with a simple wireframe. We use tools like Envision where we can have collaborative feedback loops between our clients and our designers. That was a tool that we've probably used since we have been in business, but we've slowly transitioned to using a tool called Figma, which allows us to do more interactive design where we can do live edits. Honestly, one of the coolest things about it is if, if I'm having a conversation with one of my clients and I'm talking to them and getting their feedback, I have a designer on, on uh, the call while they're making live edits and they just think you're a wizard. They think that it's magic that's happening on the screen. It's so much more efficient and we're seeing things get done faster without having to sit and wait a week, two weeks for designs to come through. Um, and then one of our biggest, most powerful tools, honestly, is just finding a way to report on the metrics. If you're in an organization that you're married to the me metrics and your success is campaign dollars or activity or participants, we use tools like Databox that allow us to set up individual dashboards for different campaigns, different uh, social channels, different advertising campaigns that we were running all for individual clients. And then we have an overall tone for that. And uh, it allows us to share links with clients so they can see in real time where their campaigns are, how well they're doing. And we followed up with the actual physical feedback of this is where we can see improvements, but you can see this transparently day to day. Yeah, so obviously there's no shortage of technology available, right? And that's one of the comforts of marketing. There's always something new and inventive and a better, faster, more robust solution right around the corner. Um, and we'll be talking through some of the other um, the other platform choices that you can be making um, as things sort of change with, with business. But um, as it comes to a solid marketing strategy, um, we always kind of start with the end in mind. What what are, we, what are we aiming for? Um, what is the aim? And it, the components of that successful strategy, it's a kind of an acronym. So A, authenticity. Um, B, authentic. I, act with intent. Intention is huge. Um, and M, mind your medium. Um, obviously there are, like I said, no shortage of platforms out there, um, but making sure that we're being mindful about where we're spending our time, energy, resources, and messaging um, it to make it be the most fruitful for, for you all. Um, let's start with authenticity. So a little bit, um, all of this relates to not only social media, but any of your um, marketing communication. We've kind of all been in this crisis communication mode. Um, I don't know any marketer that's not looked around to what's everyone else doing or saying or acting or feeling. Um, and it's incredibly important during this time not to be a sheeple. Uh, don't look around and say, oh, they said that so much better, or we should have said that sooner. Um, there's a lot of regret, a lot of comparison. Um, remember that comparison is the death of joy, friends. It's not, not great. Also, when it comes to brand personalities, um, as individuals, we say this, be yourself because everyone else is taken. The same is true for a brand and organization space. If we're all sort of gunning for the same position, same voice, there's not a lot of differentiation in that. Um, so I wanna be mindful um, during this time, like, Kix is a, an informative but a lighthearted brand. We're not delivering hard-hitting news. Um, our aim as a brand is to, to 
make people think differently, um, but also leave them feeling better with every interaction. So if you follow us on social media, you're going to get some lighthearted things behind the scenes. We're going to give you some things to do during your COVID quarantine um, that make you feel better, but also maybe look at marketing in a way that you haven't done or inspire you to do something that you haven't quite done yet. So when you're doing these things in terms of this authenticity piece and basic branding, answering or revisiting the questions, you know, who are you as an organization? Um, who do you serve? What pain points are you solving? And what should that brand or product experience feel like? And inversely, what shouldn't it feel like? Um, now is a great time to revisit some brand guidelines. And many times we see instances where a brand guide is just really, it stops short of the finish line, right? It's not quite to the end zone. Um, it's at the 20 yard line where a lot of the aesthetics are covered, your logo development, colors, fonts, and things of this nature. The stuff is, it's important, don't get me wrong, but it is elementary if it's not developed on the messaging side as well. And messaging now more than ever um, is, is the most important thing. As I mentioned earlier, there's going to be a lot of um, sort of brand confusion because brands are confused. They're trying to figure out where they fit into this evolving marketplace. Um, but it's important to kind of remain constant and reassure your audience um, an emotional connection with your brand to demonstrate empathy. It's incredibly important. Um, and a lot of you might be artists on here. Obviously, I don't need to tell you that the aesthetics are incredibly important. Content and context is incredibly important, um, but 90% of what our brains are transmitting and accepting is visual. So how we demonstrate that we care um, and are showing engagement, can visuals can make a, a big difference for a brand, uh, especially during this time. I want to talk through um, some examples of local brands that are just doing an awesome job that we have seen. I know that the news has been covered with good news stories of brands that have been forced to sort of change the way that they do things, but I think it's what we're going to talk through some examples of, of brands that are staying true to what they do, but also finding win wins in this short run um, when they've been forced to change. So the shop in Indy, they're known for their t shirts and swag. Um, the hospitality industry, as most of us know, has been hit harder than any. They had a t shirt and did a social media awareness campaign around selling that t shirt, and proceeds went to help those in the hospitality industry, and that sold like hotcakes so quick. So, again, an example of a win win, and you're still showing up the same as the same sort of entity that the, the community of followers has grown to know, love, and trust. Um, Tinker House uh, is a beautiful event space by the Monon. It's right above Provider Coffee. Um, I miss that place so much. They're a client of ours. Um, this is an example of one of those things where, um, you know, gatherings of, of, you know, corporate events or weddings, they're not happening right now. Um, this industry has virtually been shut down, um, but to inspire people to think about a time where this won't be permanent, right? They're encouraging people to book well into the future. Um, they're taking advantage of virtual tours and they're trying to stimulate the economy and, and their friends and the community as best they can. So people who are booking for events into the future, they're incentivizing with some gift cards and things for, for local groups um, around town. Another um, group called Supremacy, um, they've pivoted to meal delivery um, and subscription services. The cool part with them is um, for every soup that you're ordering, you have an ability to add on um, a meal for a person with food insecurity. Last month or last week, they did over a thousand meals and are on pace this, this week to do 1500. It's win-win, it's great um, as, as a, as an activism point, it's great from a PR perspective and it's staying true to who they are. They, um, you know, if there's a saying like, if you don't change, you die. And in this instance, it's very true for these organizations. We have to find ways in which to be nimble and agile and, and tackle problems with innovation and optimism. Um, and these are some great examples. Hotel Tango, um, West Fork Whiskey, they're bottling their cocktail mixers. And I don't know about you guys, but I've been drinking more than normal. Um, 
Um, and according to most of the news reports, so is most of America. So I am not isolated in, in my cocktail consumption, but they're supporting people with curbside pickup and their social media presence is a way in which they're getting that great news out in front of their loyal following so that people will be there um, when all of this sort of bounces back um, and they're staying relevant in the minds and hearts while this is all going on. So that authenticity piece, I just, whatever you're doing or, or however, um, whoever you're speaking to, just remember that, that people, especially during this time of change, really depend on some constant reinforcement of some things that haven't changed. Um, the other thing is intention. So I said act with intent. And this has a lot of implication here. So you are being expected to do more with, with less right now. And there will probably be some things that never go quite back to, to normal. Um, and some optimization that happens that could be really good as an outcome for all of this. But the knee-jerk reaction for a lot of small to mid-sized businesses in times where uh, sales are slowing down or um, the way you, know, you can't get people in the door. It's really easy to look at marketing on the whole and chop off the arm and say, oh, we don't have to eliminate a person. We can just eliminate this entire budget. It's a really bad idea to sort of take a meat cleaver and pound the marketing budget to death. It's, may, it's much more of a wise idea to look at that um, with under a microscope and kind of use a scalpel to optimize it and to tweak it over, over time. Um, and that way you're, you're maintaining relevance. Um, one example I wanted to, because intention is, is really big here and, and it kind of corresponds with authenticity too. So there was an article uh, of a series of tweets. Um, there was the National Cowboy Museum in Oklahoma and the museum can't have frequenters coming in and out, but the security guard is still kind of banning the ship. And Seth, who's the director of marketing gave free reign to this 60 plus year old man security guard who had never been on Twitter before, kind of turned over the reins for Tim to give a firsthand account of what it's like in that National Cowboy Museum. And the tweets were adorable. Um, he was figuring Twitter out. They, um, he would take uh, selfies, but backward. And he'd report that Seth for marketing says I should go do this, or Seth for marketing says I should do that. And then he'd come back with a properly framed selfie when he figured out he needed to get in front of the camera. And he was like, I'm, apparently I'm not supposed to put this hat on or like he was, and this, this is my favorite section of the museum. But the cool part about it was, is that they grew their following exponentially because he was giving this very real, raw, authentic experience that wasn't polished or planned. It was completely on the cuff. And it was a great reminder for marketers that sometimes the most organic experience is just the best way to go about it. Um, Twitter is one such medium, and Josh is gonna talk about some of the others. Yeah, I think the the tone or the the notion of <clears throat> doing more with less now, right? Because we have worked with a lot of not for profits that have already been doing more with less, and now the tone is, how do I do even more with even less? And it is it's unnerving a little bit, right? And it, and it can be challenging, especially because when you see your team potentially maybe shrink in size, those those um, responsibilities they shift down the line right? And it becomes an all hands on deck type of scenario, right? Everybody's got to work together. Um, I, I was talking to somebody and we, we kind of landed on the theme of, you know, before it was, you know, red versus blue, this country versus that country, but now it's, we're all in the same boat. And if we don't start rowing in the right direction, we're all just, we're all just going to be spinning in circles, right? So finding a way to get the team to go all together, do everything they can, but making sure that we're mining the mediums that we're doing it with. Where is our attention and, and time going? Uh, most of the companies that we work with, they look at digital marketing in two sects. They have um, paid marketing, then they have organic marketing. And paid marketing is pretty obvious. They, and, and they tend to focus a whole lot more on the individual parts of that, be it Google ads, be it Facebook spend, uh, spending on Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, even if they're doing media buys uh, for radio or television, they pay attention more to the things that we can try to quantify and they fail to realize that organic is the sum of the parts 
be it LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and educational posts. Maybe it's gated content. And they are more apt to remove that whole section. And what they end up doing is they lose the capabilities to keep the messaging or keep the successes that they had if they are not able to adapt and be uh, able to manage the platforms on their own. So right now, I think the, the tone more or less is that if a person exchanges money for time because they are too busy doing X that they need somebody else to run their social, now it's where do I focus my attention? Um, usually we see the platforms uh, we manage on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Twitter is a, a big one that people like to get into, but they don't understand how much you have to engage on that on a daily basis. So it kind of falls to the wayside. But then we see platforms like TikTok come through. And we have had conversations with clients that are thinking, maybe I should get into TikTok. It's got a lot of attention. It's got market share. You can go viral really quick. But you always have to ask, is it scalable? Do you have the capability to make enough in, uh, impactful content that could potentially do something for your organization? Um, I know right now, Indianapolis Colts mascot, their, their uh, TikTok is pretty popular, especially around this area. But the amount of videos that they're turning out to try to just stay relevant is to me not worth that return, right? So it's where do you focus your time and attention? I would say the best thing to do if you are one of the organizations that have to do more with even less is to turn inward and look at the analytics and say, where are my engagements coming from? We know that Facebook acquired Instagram. We know that Instagram and Facebook, TikTok, all of these platforms, they favor algorithms based on engagement and activity. We need to actually turn in and look at these, uh, these types of analytics that could tell us where we need to turn and focus the attention. For example, Instagram, the algorithm switch that happened a year or so ago, it, it really diminished anybody's um, want or desire to really start with Instagram right now. Uh, most businesses don't even think it's a viable option for them because you post a photo and it's not even in chronological order and it, and it just isn't worth their time. So the amount of attention and detail you put into maybe curating the right photo with the right message and it goes out and gets one or two likes where your Facebook analytics show that your engagement rates are tenfold over Instagram. Take away Instagram. You can add things on in the future when the world shakes back to normal if it ever does when it comes to the digital realm for your business. But another thing you could be doing is try and find ways to effectively monetize, right? So, you know, talking about uh, organizations that thrive off of, you know, charitable giving, donations, funding, um, you know, those types of things are super important before there was ways where you can have networking events where you raise dollars, but now you simply can't. And we see more people now turning into doing digital platforms, monetizing through e-commerce like WooCommerce, Shopify, throwing up something on Squarespace, any way to kind of generate revenue if your business is able to do that. We recently had a, a company that on the, on the turn of the season, it was prime time for their nursery to start going straight out and uh, selling all of their product. And all of this uh, past four weeks have turned into a potential nightmare where something that they sell that actually has a lifespan, right? So flowers and trees and um, anything you could find in a nursery. So they turned to e-commerce and it's, it's been proven to do really well for them. And the idea is that what you find in these, these times where those things are pretty heavy investments, they end up becoming potential long-term revenue streams. Things that haven't been easy before for you to do now are second nature in six months. And you've optimized your business, you've optimized revenue streams, and you've optimized your social media channels. Um, I, I think that it, it's not to it's always remembering that every minute you're spending right now is, is, a, is tied to a dollar value, whether you see it or not, right? You have 24 hours in a day. You need to focus on yourself, take care of yourself, but you also have your, your careers, you have your businesses, you have your organizations to worry about. So every second you waste on something that may not 
potentially yield return or you try it for X amount of time and it still hasn't worked. It's time to turn inward, look at the analytics, do an internal audit and really focus and hone in on the channels that are making sense for you. And I think one of the, the more interesting things um, that we've done alluding to collecting data from Google AdWords is that it is highly targeted ads. Sometimes it might not make sense for you to break off a piece of the budget to extend a paid social media campaign or to extend a Google AdWords campaign, something that's paid that might get your message out there. Um, a lot of what we've done recently is that our Google ads aren't always trying to, you know, force feed leads through talking about our services and talking about our products. We've seen a transition in how our clients and our team have been approaching Google AdWords where maybe there's a really nice piece of pillar content that educates somebody on your, um, you know, educates them on why their service makes sense or why their product makes sense. And with that, they end up pointing them to content that is now more conversational. As Brooke was saying, it's more authentic. It's not just a simple single ad. Um, and realistically, time again is money. And when you know that you're up against time, you need to make sure that if you do have the capability to find ways to sit with your team, talk to your decision makers, find things that right now are not optimized and can be optimized. A couple of things could be online invoicing if you need to send things to your clients. Um, making sure that your website is exactly what it needs to be. It should have authentic messaging. Is it telling your brand story? Do you have little quirks about your website where certain buttons don't work or you've got 404 redirects on, on your page that send people to the wrong context of information? You know, or do you sit back and say, we've gathered so much data over X amount of years, be it from form conversions or from client lists at networking events or any event for that matter, can you start to find smarter ways to segment them so you can build marketing workflows for email campaigns? Now, if I were to say where you focus your time and intention right now, knowing that people have fallen off on paid media because they are cutting their budgets or they've tapered their budgets down and they can't satisfy to be seen the entire day while your competitor or yourself could possibly extend your presence through the entire day, um, it would be looking at targeted and impactful paid advertising, then looking at making sure you're honing in on what social media channels make sense for you, followed by trying to find a way to continue to communicate, inform and educate your clients through or organic media on your websites, on blogs, um, and, and feeding that to them through email. And though it is time intensive for these things, those things could be massive payoffs for long-term productivity. Yeah. Okay, so the last thing before we kind of open things up for a Q&A, I think that might be next, um, are some actionable takeaways. So um, some of these things you might have already done, but just kind of a little checklist real quick, just to make sure that you've got your uh, I's dotted and T's crossed for some action items. So make sure that your Google listings are updated with new hours or closings. Um, make sure that if you have in-office phone lines, that those are routing somewhere um, appropriate that you're able to facilitate and that you're not leaving people hanging in any sort of way. Um, also making sure we're going back to social media outlets to make sure that those hours are consistent not only on your website but on your social profiles as well. Um, and let's make sure that you're maintaining your messaging um, on your social media as well. Uh, those automated canned messages that say somebody will get back to you only goes so far. So make sure that you're circling back in a time where routine is sort of abandoned us. <laughs> we need to make sure that we're putting people back on the, on the list and not leaving anyone high and dry. Um, and then finally, mass communication. Email is still the greatest way um, to, to get in front of people to make um, sort of blanket statements or if modes of operation have changed in any substantial way um, and as new sort of things come down the pike with our, our news cycles and so forth. Um, finally, 
A couple good practices, um, depending upon the type of business that you're um, managing. Uh, Pop-ups can be a great way once somebody lands on the website the first time, um, if something has substantially changed and or an extended blog post that you can kind of push out and repurpose through um, some email marketing here and there. And Josh mentioned uh, phone calls. We have people's attention now more than we ever have because in so many ways we've slowed things down. Um, so getting in front of people or circling back with people with a phone call can mean uh, a lot. So uh, it sounds pretty archaic for a digital marketing company to be pu pushing that, but honestly, digital marketing, it's, it's a connection um, and utilizing technology to fix and mend very human problems. And um, this of all times is certainly become a very human uh, problem that we're all kind of tackling independently, but together. So um, yeah, I guess we'll hand it back over to Bridget. Yes, thank you so much, Brooke and Josh. Really appreciate that. Um, definitely love the piece about being authentic to yourself in this time. I think that's so important, keeping your brand, your brand. Um, and which is why I'm so glad too that we have some great um, peer guests here today as well. Um, I'd like to go ahead and welcome each of them to give a little one to two minute um, uh, introduction into what they've been doing online and how it's worked for them. And um, if you're if you're feeling like it, maybe any challenges too that you're seeing too that we can all talk about. Um, Zach from Evansville from the Arts Council of Southwestern Indiana, would you like to go first? Sure. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, my name is Zach Evans. I'm um, the community director, which basically means I do marketing and event planning for the Arts Council of Southwestern Indiana. We're the regional arts partner down here in our little Evansville pocket. Um, we also have a gallery and we host concerts throughout the year. Obviously, we're not doing that right now. Um, so we are mostly focusing on producing digital content. We're doing a lot of videos. Um, we're doing uh, art studio tours, art collection tours, singer songwriter highlights, um, artist demonstration videos. And then we're also uh, writing, my cat is pushing my laptop um writing blogs and articles basically a lot of things we should have been done doing before quarantine but this has given us an opportunity to really learn how to do it well we found that our website um clicks are are doing great the uh, retention rates doing really really well social media is doing really well our email blast people are clicking on links um the one thing we haven't really fully figured out yet is how to convert that into to donations uh, to monetize it so We'll see how that goes over the next two to six weeks or more. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Zach. Thank you. Claire from Indiana Humanities, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Claire Mushbaugh. Um, if you don't know Indiana Humanities, we are the IAC's counterpart um, from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So we are a statewide organization. We are a grant giver, but we also are a programmer. So um, when we closed our offices on March 12th, um, we, like most of you, had to cancel all our programming that we had planned through um, through May, but also we've also canceled some things through June now. Um, but when that first started, we really thought about what do our people need and what do we have to uniquely offer to them? Um, and what first came to mind, I'll, t I'll give you two examples of the two of the things that we're doing. One was we commissioned um, five original films in the past year. Um, we were touring them around the state when all of this kind of broke out. So we were like, what can we do with these, this content that we already have um, to really amplify it and to engage people online? So we created a online digital film festival. Um, every week on Facebook, we're premiering one of the films. I can tell you last week we premiered the first one, which is about um, Valparaiso when it was integrated in 1968. And we had about 70 people join us live for the live part, but now we put 20 bucks behind it on Facebook ads. There's been over 10,000 views. Um, the one that we did this week was we had 90 people join us live and it's on pace to outpace the other one. So that's been really exciting and it's been really good to have um, those touch points with people and give people a place to connect with one another and connect with us. 
Um, the other thing that I will talk about that some of the other people have mentioned as well is we've seen that people are engaged. People, people want to have stuff to read. People are clicking. People are liking, which is great for us. So we've created like these weekly emails that we are pushing out that are super personal. So every week we have one of our staff people write the email that, and it comes from them personally. And we've seen lots of success with that um, and lots of really good feedback and really high click rates. So, yeah. Thanks so Thanks. much, Claire. That was great. Yeah. Um, I will say I tuned into that first video and it's really great. And they're, they're kind of short films too. So. Yeah, they're short. Yeah. Yeah. So well, they're long for us. We don't do a lot of video typically. And okay. a lot of video we do is very promotional. So this is kind of a new area for us, but it's been exciting. Yeah, it's really great. Definitely recommend everybody check that out. Um, okay, awesome. Great. Thanks, Claire. Um, I'd like to go ahead and welcome our artist on the call, our musician, Alicia from Fort Wayne. Alicia? Unmute now. Are we there? Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me? Good. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. This is a really wonderful call. I'm, I, I'm really, really, really struck by uh, what, what you had to say about, you know, authenticity in your, in your marketing. Um, you know, I, I would even take that a step further too. It's part of your brand is your personality. You know, I mean, I know people manufacture that sometimes, but a lot of us don't as artists, you know, we, we take our branding seriously um, and our personality comes out in that. So I really love that point. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I do two things. Oh, I do three. I do 19, um, but I, I'm a performer, I'm an educator, and I have a small business called Pile Style Events. Um, everything I do is under the guise of keeping it local. That is my motto, that is my personality, that is my brand. Um, so it's based in Northeast Indiana. Um, when this happened, um, on the education side, I teach for Purdue Fort Wayne School of Music. That was immediately transitioned to digital. I teach 60 private students a week. Um, transitioned over a two week period from early March as people were more comfortable until it was mandated that we needed to stay at home. So that's completely digital. Um, and I've done some digital Zoom meetings with local elementary schools, you know, for the music teachers that are trying to be creative and keep their class engaged when they can't be there with them. So education wise, just immediate switch to digital, uh, which has been wonderful to see. It's very time consuming, um, a little anxiety inducing because you know you still want your students to have the enrichment that they have when you're with them in person. But it's nice to see all of my fellow educators and how hard they're working on the university level, you know, public school and private teaching. Um, it's amazing to see. As a performer, things stopped. Um, and as for my small business that I, that I have a I, uh, partner with Dennis Junk, that is stopped, uh, Pile Style Events. So with the time I have that I'm not performing now um, and that we are not booking events, we normally book two to four events a week on the Northeast Indiana area. We book local musicians for local events of all kinds. Um, so we just immediately fund, um, funneled all of our time into a fundraiser for all of our friends right now who, who are not employed. Uh, it's not a fundraiser for us personally, um, and it was just really cool to see the community come together quickly and show support where we set an initial goal of five grand to be raised, which we hit in about eight days. And we extended the goal when they extended the stay at home order um, to $10,000 and we're up near 8,000 right now. We have two weeks left. So uh, none of us know, you know, what, what, what this holds for us as musicians and performers. I make an income as an educator, but like I say, I, I perform quite a bit, but I have friends who primarily our private contractors that make a living um, performing and so their incomes right now are cut and as you all know the government aid hasn't quite come in yet you know it's just starting to be dispersed so these last three to four weeks have been a crucial time for um, the donations that have been made in support that's immediately been dispersed to the musicians that uh, you know could, could use a, a leg up right now or a, a lot <laughs> it's really difficult and it's really scary because nobody knows how long this is gonna last but it's amazing to see it all transition to a digital platform we have a fundraiser up on Facebook. Facebook was my targeted audience because we have a target audience of probably, it sounds kind of wide, but you know, 30 to 70. And those people are on Facebook, not Instagram, not Twitter. A lot of those, some of the 30 year olds are, you know, some year olds are on Twitter, but um, most of what we do posting for this fundraiser is done on Facebook on the fundraiser itself. And of course we push that out to all of our platforms that we, that we utilize, which is many of that, you, that you've mentioned today. So it's been kind of amazing to see the, the community come together. That's my main thing is, you know, in this time of crisis where we all are having to change everything about how we operate as artists, how we perform, how we make a living, how we market. Um, 
it's just cool to see that people still care and they are stepping up. So I don't know if that's, that's what you guys are looking for. If you have any questions, let me know. Yeah, that was great. It, again, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, please feel free to go ahead and post those in the chat box. Um, definitely, I love what you said too about um, art really bringing people together when we can't mm -hmm. be together. And um, I think that's something that we're all striving to do. Um, and it's really important. Thank you so much. Caitlin from Lafayette, would you like to share what you guys are doing up there? Yeah, so um, uh, just as a reminder, I work at the Art Museum of Greater Lafayette. Uh, we closed our doors March 14th, I think was our last day. Um, and it was two days after we had our one of our most visited exhibits um, open. Um, it's our new artist, our high school exhibit, and it is it draws people from all over the community because they come to see their kids stuff and their friends stuff. And so we were really kind of sad that that never really it never even had an, a weekend. Um, so our our first big initiative was we have a wonderful photographer that we partner with here in Lafayette who came in and photographed the whole show, which he does every year. Um, but then he was kind enough to make that a photo gallery on his site that the kids can download the pictures from, the family members can download the pictures from. And we have been able to use that to, even though we can't open our doors right now, we can still share um, that art, that exhibit through Facebook, through Instagram. Um, so that's been uh, one way that we've been able to kind of still share um, what we're doing at the museum, what we have at the museum. Another thing that we do is monthly concerts. We feature local musicians. We do free concerts. It's called Friday Night Live. Um, they're normally on the last Friday of every month. So we did the March concert um, over Facebook Live and it was a huge success. So um, we decided why not do this every week? <laughs> so now we're doing the Facebook Live concerts um, every week the artists you know, host them from their living room or their studio and we share it with our with our patrons and a lot of them uh, have performed with Friday Night Live already. So the people already know like, oh, I remember that person and, and we, uh, you know, I wanna hear them again. And so that's been really great. It's been a lot of just because our, what we do is so like tied to our physical location. Um, a lot of what we've kind of been doing is how do we still have this physical and plan for the future and share what we have there now that people might not have been able to go see before we closed. Um, so that's been a lot of what we're doing. We're also planning for like creating more uh, member exclusive things like some sneak peeks at upcoming exhibits. We're planning to do a kind of a walkthrough tour uh, video series with Scott Frankenberger who has an exhibit coming up that was supposed to open in May. We're going to have we're planning to have kind of like a virtual opening um, of some sort. It's still kind of like in the works, but we're, we're planning more of kind of like a soft uh, tentative kind of opening that way instead of a big opening reception celebration on site. So um, also trying to work on, we have classes that have had to be uh, either postponed or canceled. And I know a lot of the students were looking forward to those. So we're um, working on uh, our watercolor instructor is still sending assignments and instruction um, things to her students mm -hmm. and we're working on possibly getting some more like virtual kind of tutorials how to things that people can do at home um, whether with their you know with their kids or just by themselves or as a family um, so that's kind of in the works as well um, but yeah that's that's pretty much it's all been about like okay we have all these things in one place our physical location how can we now make that accessible to everyone because they can't come so that's been kind of our big focus right now yeah absolutely thank you so much Caitlin yeah. um, we did have a question come in about email campaigns and tips about cutting through all of the noise um, to get those click rates up um, I was curious, um, Brooke and Josh, if you'd like to, to share, I know uh, Kix has a really great um, blog post about um, crafting a blog and also titling it that I am excited to share out after this webinar. But um, would you guys like to take that question? Yeah, sure. I, I kind of preemptively threw something into the chat, but I think uh, we've even, always see the same common theme, right? It's, it's 
low click-through rates on specific types of information. And one of the things that we actually did, um, myself uh, and Katie Mills, who works with our marketing team, we were discussing um, on something that is very important to us is feedback specifically from our clientele. And we send out kind of like a net promoter score email uh, once a month with a different question out that says, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Or how do you feel like we're doing on that? And, and we saw a, a run where it was kind of abysmal. It wasn't doing well. And so what we found was, could it be the layout of the email? And, and Claire had said something where it's, it's coming from somebody personally, uh, where that has a lot of authenticity. And right now, it's, it's no mystery that everybody can tend to over-engineer their, their newsletters. Um, they're really stylistic. They almost look like a landing page for a website. Then they point you to a website. And it, and it can just make you look like more of the same. Um, so what we did, we set up A-B testing with um, different styles. One that comes from something that has a little bit more style. One that has something that looks just like a general email coming from an average user on Gmail, right? Um, and we're still collecting the data to see which one is more favorable, but you see different interactions tentatively go to the ones that are a little bit more authentic. But then there is a time and place for those stylistic, fanciful designed emails. Um, we use one for our newsletter when our clients launch any websites. Um, you know, those have some flair and fun to them uh, to be a little bit more engaging. But then when Haley Cook, our um, marketing strategist sends out monthly reports. It's very authentic looking. It's got snapshots of specific data points. But um, I think what we have found is that it comes down to the style, making sure that the information that they're looking for is readily available where you want them to see it. It's not buried down in the email. And if it, if it comes down to open rates, it could be because of what type of email that you're using. And one thing we used to do when we would send out newsletters letters would be hello at Kix Digital. That's the email that would show up that it's coming from. We saw more engagement go up when we changed it to come from Brooke's email um, because ultimately she'll field any questions if it's related to sales or uh, mm -hmm. any partnership um, opportunities. And we saw engagement go up from that. And now we also think that it has to do more with the headlines. Um, using something that's a little bit more catchy. Uh, we did a goofy email, uh, I believe it was, I broke, I, correct me if I'm wrong, it was the, the Friday the 13th, or it was, uh, I think it was Halloween, and it was our Happy Halloween newsletter. And instead <laughs> of coming from Brooke, it said, Happy Halloween, and then the sender was Freddy Krueger. And if that doesn't spike your interest to click on, then, you know, I don't know what will, but it, it comes down to the headlines too. I have to say this too, because I think one of the questions uh, like had to do with how to construct blog posts too. So graphics are incredibly important and intention grabbing. So, so on this Halloween theme, I mean, we really get down for a theme, but we changed all of our faces to, I think, what was I? I was Pennywise. Like it was Pennywise, yeah. sort of horror. Everybody came, became their own horror character. Yeah, cool. it, was, it was great. Um, Bridget, I think you asked about constructing blog posts and, and publishing content. So I think some of the things that are most important to remember there are that headlines matter, um, that the title you choose is critically important. Also, we live in this BuzzFeed culture. So make sure that you're prioritizing the content and the takeaways that you're wanting people to really cling to and the things that you know you, they need to walk away from. So things like bullet bullet points, don't be afraid to use your H2s um, and, and subheads. Like if you got long form body stuff, make sure that you're breaking it apart, add visuals um, and, as you can. And then ultimately when you're sharing those things on social media, don't be afraid to do some double checking to make sure that your image quality in, is, is transferring properly. Because sometimes there can be some glitches in that um, at the at the image level that just makes it bad for the brand. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much, you guys. I can't believe an hour is already over. Um, I know I feel like I've learned so much and I'm sure the field feels the same. Um, and thank you everybody to, that joined us um, on the call as participants. Um, We'll be following up tomorrow with resources that were mentioned today. Um, there were quite a few um, 
content managing platforms that were mentioned, uh, ways to collaborate with your team. And we'll be sure to, to gather all those up and send them in one nice email for you. Um, as long, uh, in addition to the recording, um, please join us next week, uh, same time, same place for a conversation on how um, the arts can support Indiana's youth during this public health crisis. I know Alicia talked a little bit about how her education uh, hat has kind of changed a little bit, how she's pivoting online. So we'll be talking about that next week and all of that information will be in the follow-up email. Thanks again, Zach, Claire, Alicia, Caitlin, Brooke, and Josh for joining us. And of course, all of you, I hope you have a great day. Bye.